and drove into their vehicle. Luckily, he slept with his legs tucked up. If he hadn't, they would have got crushed. The insurance company didn't pay out, and the sheriffs are in no mood to stand in line. I'm here to execute a high court writ. Hang on, sir. I called the control. OK, thank you. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. When a supermarket boss refuses to clear his debt, Tracy threatens to clear his shelves. And there's been an order issued for us to recover this money today. Otherwise, we will be removing goods. Susan Carolan spent thousands of pounds on a garden summer house. The first time it rained, the water just absolutely poured through. When the man who sold it says he can't pay her back, Tracy and Dave get the clamp out. It's 7 o'clock in the morning, and enforcement agents Tracy Lee and Dave Steele are in Cheshire, heading to a debtor's home address. This morning we're in Macclesfield, um, hoping to meet up with a Mr Richard at Lovenbury. This debt um, is in relation to some faulty building works done. Uh, from looking at the nose, it seems to be in relation to a summer house that the uh, defendants fitted for the client. Uh, it seems that the client's not been happy with the service provided. The money is owed to disabled pensioner Susan Carolan. She decided to have a 32-foot summer house built at the top of her garden to provide a comfortable retreat for her 92-year-old father. I got a few quotes, you know, from different people. I didn't really know anything about sheds. One of the people who came out to look at the job and quote for it was Richard Lovenbury. He said that he would give me a five-year guarantee, so it was all rather convincing, you know. The total cost would be nearly £5,000. The base was laid and construction of the summer house got underway. But Susan was unable to keep an eye on the work. I was ill at the time. I am disabled. I have, um, you know, bad arthritis. I have trouble walking sometimes, you know, with my legs and hips. When Susan did finally see the summer house, her heart sank. It had been painted pink, not the apricot crush colour she had asked for. It was dreadful, the painting on it. And it looked like pink undercoat, to be quite honest. I was quite shocked. But Susan was even more upset by flaws in the way the summer house had been constructed. The base hadn't been laid properly. I said, but that base is not level, and the building's not level, and it's all out of sync, you know, and it's leaning backwards. Susan could see the shed didn't line up to the fence, and the roof wasn't up to much either. And the first time it rained, the water just absolutely poured through. And the materials were below the standard she and Mr Lovenbury had agreed to. I'd ordered 16 mil wood and only got 11 mil wood. It was upsetting to know that you'd been ripped off. It was embarrassing, really. It was not just my money, it was Dad's money as well, and it was something for him, you know, this disabled garden. She had an independent survey carried out, which confirmed her fears. The summer house Mr Lovenbury had supplied was finished to a poor standard and wasn't fit for purpose. When I kept complaining, Lovenbury said it's not my responsibility as manufacturers. They said it's not our responsibility, it's Lovenbury. So for about a year, it just went backwards and forwards. Eventually, she decided to take both Mr Lovenbury and the manufacturers to the small claims court in an attempt to get her money back. As proceedings got underway, Richard Lovenbury made an admission that took Susan by surprise. He just stood up in court and said, I want to admit to everything, it's all my responsibility. The claim against the manufacturers was dropped, and Mr Lovenbury was ordered to pay back the money Susan had spent on the summer house. But she still didn't receive it. So in desperation, she transferred the case up to the High Court and called in the sheriffs. I thought, there's no way I can deal with him trying to get money every month. So that's why I put it up to the sheriffs. 
With court costs and fees, Susan is now owed £6,168. It's now down to Tracy and Dave to get Susan what she's owed. As they get close to Mr Lovenbury's address, Tracy is on the lookout for one asset in particular. The file says Mr Lovenbury drives a BMW that should be worth enough to cover the debt. The RBM, it's tidy. 09 plate. Tracy makes sure it's not going anywhere. I'm just going to grab this clamp. Try and get this on before we get a response at the door. Dave goes to introduce himself, but it looks like whoever's inside has seen him coming. Somebody just opened the curtains and had a look, possibly the defendant. So he's up and about, so I think he's seen us, he knows what's going on, so let's see if he's going to answer the door. By the time Tracy's finished with the clamp, the door opens. Good morning, Mr. Lovenbury, Mr. Mrs. You'd better ask the gentleman, not me. For BBC One documentary series called The Sheriff's Coming. Right, can you go away? Tracy and Dave are invited in, but we leave Mr. Lovenbury's property and film from the road. Inside, the sheriffs explain they've come to collect Susan's money. Right, obviously you're aware of the debt for Susan and Carolyn. What is your position in getting it settled? Mr. Lovenbury tells Dave he's tried to set up a payment plan, but the sheriffs can't agree to one without making sure it's a good deal for Susan. They need to view and assess his assets. The shed salesman says he's only recently back at work after a period of absence and offers to pay just £100 a month. But with £6,168 outstanding, it would take years to clear the debt at that rate. The sheriffs know Susan wants her money sooner than that, and Tracy asks about the vehicle outside the property. There is a Ford car parked next to the BMW on their list that apparently belongs to the debtor, but it's 14 years old and probably worth less at auction than the cost of removing it. The BMW is worth considerably more, but his partner says it belongs to her and that it's on finance. She also tells Tracy the house is hers alone and so are all the goods inside it. Unfortunately, it looks like everything belongs to his partner. It's, the tenancy agreement is in her name. Uh, we're just waiting to get the papers for the vehicle on finance. It's her car. And sadly, he has been out of work for quite some time. He's stating that there is nothing at all available today. Um, and he's looking to put forward a proposal on a monthly basis. The tenancy agreement checks out. So Dave calls the office to make sure what they've been told about the vehicle is correct. There's no finance attached. It's on finance, but it's not. Well, I know it's not on finance, but why did you say it were? It's not here, isn't it? Well, yeah. It's his car, I'm telling you. If the car had been on finance, the sheriffs couldn't take it. Tracy has a hunch the reason they were told it was must be that the car belongs to the debtor himself. We've just telephoned the office and it's showing free from finance. So you've lied to me there. I need the DVLA papers or it's going to be removed. For a moment, it looks like the sheriffs are going to be able to take the car, sell it and pay Susan some of her money back. Have you found it? The V5 document doesn't prove ownership, but with other paperwork in the woman's name, Tracy has changed her mind. Thank you. Right. I shall go and give her this back and uh, take the clump off. So the sheriffs are now convinced it is her car and that means they're left with nothing of value to take control of. With no leverage, it's back to a payment arrangement. Dave is inside the house and continues to push for the best deal possible for Susan. It's up to the client if they're going to accept any arrangement, so it may work for you if you can get some form of lump sum. So what, what can you pay today, Mr Lovenbury? Can you pay anything? Mm -hmm. 500, 1,000? Eventually, Mr Lovenbury comes up with £150 and his partner transfers another 200 They agree he'll continue to pay 150 a month. That's as much as we can push it. There's no assets to uh, have any leverage with. It's better than nothing. And Dave plans to review the arrangement after six months with a view to increasing the payments. Susan's happy they've done as much as they can. They'll collect the money. And if he doesn't pay, they'll go back round and see him. I think the sheriffs are really great, good guys. <laughs> Yes.
Using the county courts to try and recover money you're owed isn't difficult. One and a half million money claims are paid every year in England and Wales, involving anything from faulty goods or poor workmanship to unpaid invoices. Claims can be filed online or by post for a small fee. Both parties in the case will be asked to submit evidence, and you may have to attend a court hearing. If you're successful, a county court judgment, or CCJ, will be issued against the debtor. If they still don't pay, that's when you call the sheriffs. High Court Enforcement Agents Tracy Lee and Adam Crosley are in West Yorkshire in pursuit of an unpaid bill. We're off to a um, supermarket, Dong Dong Oriental Supermarket. That looks like it's from a supplier. The supermarket was taken to court when it failed to pay for a delivery of goods. The claim wasn't contested, and a judgment was made in favour of the supplier. When they still didn't get paid, it was transferred to the High Court for enforcement. Today, it's Tracy and Adam's job to get what's owed. We're looking to recover just over £2,000. Whoa, we're here. Adam and Tracy head inside, and there's an employee at the checkout. Hello, could I speak to the proprietor, please? Is the owner here? Fortunately, the boss is here, and moments later, he emerges from the back of the shop. Hello. I caught enforcement agent. I'm here with um, an unpaid debt. He's shown the paperwork and seems to know about the amount. How much is it? It's for 2,129. No. What do you mean, no? no? I, don't, I don't have that. That's the one. They delivered to us. Right. And the ways that we return it back. Right. I have no idea what this company is doing. The cause of the dispute is no concern of Tracy's. She wastes no time explaining what it means when sheriffs arrive at the door with a writ. This has been through court, and there's been an order issued for us to recover this money today. Otherwise, we will be removing goods. So are you in a position to pay this in full before I start listing goods with a view to removing? But the thing is, why... Right, if you've got a dispute, you're going to have to deal with it down the correct channels. I'm not here today to dispute this with you. I'm here to enforce it. Can I give a call to them, to them company? Right, you can call who you want, but this needs to be paid. I'm going to give you 20 minutes. If this isn't paid, I'll start listing. And if Tracy does start listing items to be removed, the amount they owe will go up. At this point, the boss asks us to leave the shop, so we continue to film from the roadside. The boss tells Tracy he will pay the debt. Yeah, you can pay it by card. Adam comes outside to update us. I think he's contacting his wife, he's disputing it. We're waiting for a credit card or a debit card to appear to get it paid in full. So we'll keep you updated on, on that. Adam goes back to join Tracy, but instead of the money, it's the boss's wife that appears. Adam reminds them that not paying up isn't in their interests. And if it's not paid, you end up with another further £495 plus VAT. Are you refusing to pay it? They are, and that's not all. He's going to call the police. Right, OK, well... Right. The shop's refusal to pay means the sheriff's attention turns to their assets. It's going to take a lot of instant noodles, but Tracy reluctantly starts listing goods for removal. These are nice cookers. Rice cookers. Yeah, a, a, a value. And that comes with a cost. The enforcement has now moved to stage two, which means the extra £600 Adam warned about has been added to the debt. This has now been taken to stage two. You've incurred a further cost. You've refused to pay it. I've started to list goods. Faced with escalating costs and the very real prospect of losing their stock, the shopkeepers now agree to pay, but not the extra fees. Tracy's not impressed. The shop didn't offer anything until she was forced to escalate, and she's not going to back down now. I'm running out of patience now. This is the stage we've got to. We're not backpedaling now. The figure you need to pay is that. We can stop there and you can pay the 27, or we can continue and it'll go up again. It's not Mickey Mouse this, you know. And with that, Dong Dong Oriental Supermarket's arguments are over. They pay the debt and their extra costs on a card was going to pay it at one point. His wife's come along, spoken to him. The next thing, they're not paying it. They're calling the police. It's gone to stage two, and then he's tried to backpedal. It's been a tough afternoon, 
but the sheriffs have done what they came to do. The shop's supplier will now get the money they're owed. Dong Dong Oriental Supermarket told us they didn't pay their supplier because their goods didn't meet UK food standards. They said they have been in business for 10 years and have never been late paying their suppliers. And that they initially refused to pay the sheriffs because they hadn't been aware of the county court judgment or high court writ. One of the biggest challenges consumers face when they take on big companies is navigating endless recorded phone messages and finding the right person to talk to. It can be a frustrating process. When the sheriffs turn up to collect a debt in person, they've got powers that consumers don't have, so they can get results where we can't. It's midday in the capital. High Court Enforcement Agents Andy Joyruff and A.D. Long are on their way to the head office of one of the country's largest insurance companies. We're there after Axel Insurance Company um, in central London. We're there to collect a debt of just over £1,300, obviously a large company. We don't know what we're going to be confronted with, but in being in central London, I should imagine it's one of these big, huge, modern places. Sometimes the sheriffs do have to go round the houses like the rest of us. A few of the problems that we'll face whilst enforcing against big companies is trying to locate that one person that's authorised to make payments on behalf of the company. Another problem that we'll find as well is uh, security. They will try and stop us. It's their job, but they will be breaking the law uh, by trying to prevent us from carrying out our duty. Andy and AD's writ is for an unpaid motor insurance claim owed to this man, 35-year-old Ben Anderson. Ben had been taking two-year-old son Jack to visit his grandparents. We were looking forward to a nice weekend with the family. He always spoiled him absolutely rotten, like grandparents do. They were stopped in traffic when a car travelling at 40 miles an hour slammed into the back of them shunting them into the car in front. When the car hit, it was just a massive crash. The whole impact squashed the car and the back seat got pushed up against the back of my seat. The car sustained heavy damage. Jack was in a child seat in the back and the impact left it squashed up against the seat in front of him. I was obviously in shock, but my first priority was to make sure that Jack was OK. He was crying, shaking and screaming. Nothing else in that moment mattered. And when you see your child in such distress, everything else kind of goes out the window. Jack was terrified, but had avoided being seriously hurt. Luckily, he slept with his legs tucked up, because if, if he hadn't, that would have been crushed against the back of my seat. For him to, to come away without any injuries, it, it was a miracle. It wasn't until later that Ben realised he had been hurt in the crash. I sustained whiplash. I had extreme pain in my left shoulder. It would just hurt to do basic things like picking my son up. So that impacted me a lot for, for a long period afterwards, the, the accident as well. The driver who hit him admitted responsibility. After a medical examination, their insurance company, AXA, agreed to pay compensation for Ben's injuries and the written-off vehicle, as well as the child seat and a pushchair that were ruined in the crash. But despite repeatedly chasing them, the money never arrived. And this just rumbled on for months and months. I'd be ringing my solicitor, sort of every week, like, have you heard anything? Have we received any payment? And every time they were saying, no, we haven't, we've been chasing them, they're not getting back to us. Every time AXA would say they'd been sending out the cheque and it'd been going to the wrong address, it, the, the cheque was being sent back, and then it was going to the bottom of the queue of all their claims to make, and then they were sending it out to the wrong address again. 
Ben replaced the child's seat and pushchair out of his own pocket. But he still urgently needed a car for work. He couldn't wait for Axa to get round to paying up and had to borrow the money. My dad had to take that money out of his savings. I really need to get this resolved so I can pay him back. Axa eventually paid part of the claim, but with the rest still outstanding, Ben took them to court. When they didn't offer a defence, the judge ordered that they finally pay up, but still, they haven't done so. Ben's now had the judgment upgraded to the High Court and got a writ for the money. For them to agree to pay me this money and then for it to go on month after month without getting anywhere, I just need this weight lifted off my shoulder. I'm really hoping that the sheriffs um, can can get this money for me. Back in London, that's exactly what Andy and Aidy are planning to do. They have the power to enter a debtor's premises in the execution of a writ, even if those premises are gleaming glass towers belonging to multinationals. The company is a very big company. We know that they're good for the money. They will have the assets available to us for removal if necessary. But before they do that, they need to find the right place. Even for enforcement agents carrying high court writs, the big city can be a confusing place. What is it? Is it down there? It's up there on the left. Wherever it is, it's a long way from home. Being from a little Cornish town, it's something else when you actually get down into London and you you look at it from the ground up. Just the size of it. AD's usual patch is the Welsh Valleys. I don't think I could live in a city. The thing is, you've got all this traffic. I mean, crazy, absolutely crazy. The gridlock. They eventually manage to navigate the city's labyrinthine one-way systems and find the address on the writ. Axa, there we are. They head in to demand the payment of Ben's insurance claim. Entering the lobby, Andy spots a man at the electronic barriers who looks like security. Hi, sir. My name's uh, Mr. Dry from Enforcement Agent, here to execute a High Court writ. Yeah, hang on, sir. I called the control. Okay. Thank you. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. Can you still be Hello, sir. Can you still be sir? I was there here. No, like no, I said. Yes, okay. Like I said. Well, I call enforcement. Yeah, not a problem. Give, give, give them a call. What's that? What's that? I'm, I'm the same. We've just gained entry into the building. Um, the security uh, guard on the ground floor opened up the uh, gates in order to come out to speak with ourselves. Uh, as he came out, the gates were still open, so I've walked on through. Sheriffs have the court given power to bypass front desks. There's nothing the security man can do to remove them now. He gets on his walkie-talkie, and moments later, a woman appears to speak to them. We're here to enforce a high court writ of control. Is that who you're here to see? AXA Insurance. OK, and has somebody been called? We're just uh, getting that sorted out now, I believe. Right, and uh, who in extra insurance are you here to see? My, my name's Mr. Joyeth, OK? There's my identification, OK? I'm here today in order to execute a High Court writ of control against AXA Insurance UK PLC for an outstanding debt. Uh, so I, I need to go and talk to our legal team, which I'll go and do. OK. You wait here, I'll, I'll go and do that now. The sheriffs are used to companies of this size taking a while to identify claimants and finding the right person to deal with them. So they're happy to wait for now. There is to be no filming. Our cameraman isn't welcome to wait with them, however, and we retreat to the road. Inside, security don't really want the sheriffs hovering by the lift, but can't persuade them to take a seat out of view. So we'll just wait inside of the barriers, OK? okay. And so they wait. I'm, I'm not going to make us uh, wait around all day. The sheriffs are entitled to carry out a diligent search at a debtor's premises and start listing their assets. 
But before Andy decides to press the point and go upstairs, someone comes down in the lift to talk to him. All right, it's Mr. Joria from the sheriff's office. OK, do you want to come up? They're taken upstairs, and with Andy going through the paperwork with an AXA lawyer, AD comes outside to update us. At the moment, it's being looked into. Um, it looks as if we will get payment. Um, obviously, it's such a large company. They've got to look into the solicitors, the reason behind um, the debt hasn't been paid. Um, as soon as that comes back, um, she will be paid and uh, settled. AD reckons Andy's decision to bypass security helped speed up the process. Most places, they don't understand the actual power that uh, we have got in uh, going into buildings. We have got the power and we can go in and remove. With Andy in control upstairs, AD decides to leave him to it and stay with the van. Parking is extremely difficult and expensive in this part of London. So, with a parking warden patrolling, AD decides his best bet is to keep moving. I just have to drive around the block. <laughs> he heads off, expecting Andy to be following him downstairs with payment in a minute or two. But nearly an hour later, he's still circling, and Andy is still upstairs, trying to get Ben Anderson the money he's owed. Moving around. Eventually, Andy reappears. Oh, sir. He's had to do it without AD, but he's got the payment in full. Fantastic result. Uh, the accounts department have uh, put through the payment. I've checked with uh, our accounts now. Full payment has been received. All £1,357. Good timing. Fantastic. We'll uh, get in the van. All right, AD? All right. How many laps you've done? <laughs> oh, lost count of the fight. <laughs> right, yo, let's go. Andy and AD head out of London as fast as possible. Fourteen days later, the sheriffs were able to transfer to Ben the insurance payout he was entitled to. I'd like to 